Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, Committee for Justice, Concerned Women of America, the American Center for Law and Justice, Heritage Action, Liberty Council, Family Research Council, Eagle Forum, and there are others. I yield the floor. The Senator from Vermont. I understand morning business will now close. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination, the Judiciary, Caitlin Joan Halligan of New York to be United States Circuit Judge for the District of Columbia Circuit. Under the previous order, there will be time for debate until noon, equally divided in the usual form. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I've heard that some of the people who propose Ms. Halligan were also some of the same people who opposed an effort in the successful effort in the Congress to actually protect police officers a, a few years ago. So I, I put that in um, I put that in context, and it's probably why so many law enforcement groups support Ms. Halligan because she stood up for law enforcement, unlike some of the groups we've heard about who oppose her, who sought to make the life of police officers more dangerous. Be that as it may, we stand at a crossroads today, voting to end the partisan filibuster of this judicial nomination is as important as it was when the Senate did so in connection with the nomination of Judge McConnell to the United States District Court of Rhode Island earlier this year. If we, <clears throat> if we allow the partisan filibuster to go forward, then we're going to be setting a new standard that no nominee can meet, <clears throat> can meet if they wish to be confirmed to the D.C. Circuit. <clears throat> When I hear Republican senators who just a few years ago argued that filibusters against judicial nominees were unconstitutional and said that they would never support such a filibuster, and those who care about the judiciary and the Senate need to step forward and do the right thing, you can't say that filibusters against judicial nominees are unconstitutional when you have a Republican president, but suddenly we have to have filibusters when it's a Democratic president. Uh, even on the standards that have driven the approval rating of the Congress at all times low for hypocrisy, this goes even beyond that standard. We ought to end the filibuster now. Proceed to vote on this extraordinarily well-qualified woman. Ms. Halligan, nominated to fill one of three vacant seats on the important D.C. Circuit, is a highly regarded appellate advocate. She has a kind of impeccable credentials in both public service and private practice that has been looked for by, in the past by both Democratic and Republican presidents and makes her unquestionably qualified to serve on the D.C. Circuit. Her nomination reminds me that of John Roberts when he was confirmed by every single Democrat and every single Republican to the D.C. Circuit in 2003. Now, I certainly did not agree with every position he had taken or argument he made as a high-level lawyer in several very conservative Republican administrations, but I supported his nomination to the D.C. Circuit as I did to the Supreme Court because of his legal excellence and ability. Madam President, it is frustrating to have senators tell me privately that they know Ms. Halligan is just as qualified as John Roberts was, but gosh, there's this lobby and that lobby and the other lobby, and they're against her. Lobbies come and go. The courts are supposed to be the epitome of justice in this country. Now, I trust that John Roberts testimony that fairly apply the law of confirmed. If that standard which we use for him is, uh, is 
apply to her, then there's no question this filibuster will end and Caitlin Halligan will be confirmed by any traditional standard. Caitlin Halligan is the kind of superbly qualified nominee, and she should easily be confirmed by the Senate to use the same standards that have always been used. Yet the Senate Republican leadership's filibuster of this nomination threatens to set a new standard that could not be met by anyone. It wouldn't have been met by John Roberts. It's not going to be met by Ms. Halligan if this is a new standard. And I think that's wrong. I think it's unjustified. I think it's dangerous. But it'll take a handful of sensible Senate Republicans willing to buck their leadership and some single-issue lobbies. They've done it before. They should again now. Those who care about the judiciary, but even as important, Madam President, those who care about the Senate, need to come forward and end this filibuster. Yesterday, I put into the record some of the many letters of support we've received from Ms. Halligan's nomination from those from across the political spectrum. These are letters are a testament both to her exceptional qualification to serve and to the fact that she should be a consensus nomination, not a source of controversy and contention. They attest to the fact that she is not a closed-minded ideologue, the kind of nominee who has demonstrated not only legal talent, but also a dedication to the rule of law throughout her career. We should encourage nominees with the qualities of Ms. Halligan to, incur, to engage in public service. We should welcome people like her on the federal bench, not denigrate them. Concocted controversies and a blatant misreading of Ms. Halligan's record as an advocate no reason to obstruct this outstanding nomination. And I also demonstrated yesterday any so-called caseload concern is no justification for filibustering this nomination. This was not a concern we heard from Republicans when they voted to confirm President Bush's nominees to fill not only the ninth seat, but also the tenth seat and the eleventh seat on this court just a couple of years ago. So they shouldn't use caseload as an excuse to filibuster President Obama's nomination to fill the ninth seat when the D.C. Circuit's caseload has increased, and especially with a lesser caseload, they felt the ninth and the tenth and the eleventh seat should be filled. There's only two differences today. One, the caseload has increased, not decreased, and oh yes, it's a Democratic president, not a Republican president. By any objective measure, the work of the D.C. Circuit has grown. The multiple vacancies should be filled, not preserved and extended for partisan purposes. The extraordinary circumstance that exists here is the more than one quarter vacancy level on this court with only eight active judges. Given Caitlin Halligan's impeccable credentials and the widespread support there is for her, this should be the kind of consensus nomination supported by senators of both parties who seek to ensure that the federal bench attracts the best and the brightest. Certainly by any standard utilized in 2005 to end filibusters and vote on President Bush's controversial nominees, this filibuster should be ended. The Senate should vote in the nomination. Those senators who claim to subscribe to a standard that prohibits filibusters of judicial nominees except in extraordinary circumstances should keep their word, should keep their word, Madam President, and not support this filibuster. There are no extraordinary circumstances to justify the filibuster. Kaylin Halligan has no character problem no ethics problem, and no justification for this filibuster. Caitlin Halligan is a superbly qualified nominee whose personal integrity and temperament and abilities have been attested to by many leading lawyers, both those who have been on her side in cases and those who have opposed her side in cases they all attest to her integrity and temperament and abilities. The signers of that 2005 Memorandum of Understanding and the Senate demonstrated what they thought that agreement entailed, and they proceeded to invoke cloture on a number of controversial nominations. The Senate invoked cloture on the nomination of Janice Rogers Brown, Thomas Griffith to the D.C. Circuit, 
the circuit to which Caitlin Halligan is also nominated. So I urge Republican and Democratic senators to come together and end this misguided filibuster of Caitlin Halligan's nomination to the D.C. Circuit. They should vote cloture on her nomination. There is no basis under any appropriate standard for blocking her nomination from an up and down vote. To the contrary, Caitlin Halligan's impeccable credentials and record as an accomplished advocate make her nomination worthy of bipartisan support. Madam President, I would suggest the absence of quorum and would it ask that the time be equally divided. Without objection, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hickok. I'd ask uh, that the call of the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. And Madam President, I have seven unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent these requests be agreed to. Without objection. And they be printed in the record. Without objection. Madam President, I see the distinguished senator from New York on the, on the floor. And uh, I have a feeling that she will have a statement of support of this superb nominee, and I yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Senator from New York. Thank you, Madam President. I am very, very, very proud to support the nomination of Caitlin Halligan to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Caitlin Halligan has distinguished herself through her commitment to fairness, reasoned intellect, personal ethics, and a profound respect for the law. Unfortunately, it appears that some of my colleagues are determined to criticize her regardless of the facts or her record. The major concern seems to be the workload demands for the D.C. Circuit. This is not a reason to oppose this candidate's nomination. In 2008, the Senate acted to reduce the number of seats on the D.C. Circuit from 12 to 11, increasing the caseload for each of the judges. Currently, there are only eight active judges on the D.C. Circuit, leaving the, be the bench more than 27 percent vacant. That means the U.S. Circuit Court currently has three vacancies, three vacancies on a court that is currently handling more than 1,200 cases, three vacancies on a court that handles some of the most complicated decisions, including terrorism cases. <clears throat> Today, we have the opportunity to fill one of these vacancies on the D.C. Circuit, often called the second most important court in the entire United States. The caseload of the D.C. Circuit has remained consistent since 2005, while the number of cases per judge has increased by 33 percent. If Ms. Halligan is confirmed, it will reduce that caseload from its current level of approximately 161 pending cases to approximately 143 per judge still substantially higher than during the previous administration. 
The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals reviews complicated decisions and rulemaking of many federal agencies and in recent years has handled some of the most important terrorism and detention cases since the horrific attacks on September 11. These cases are complex, requiring additional time to allow for the consideration they demand. Many of my colleagues have raised concerns with positions Ms. Halligan advocated while Solicitor General of New York. She filed briefs at the direction of the Attorney General. She was not promoting her own personal views. Many of these cases focus explicitly on New York State's rights to govern in traditional state law areas. Caitlin Halligan is a woman of superb intellect, a history of laudable achievement, and a record of outstanding public service. Not only does she deserve an up or down vote, but on the merits, she deserves the full support of the Senate. I ask my colleagues to allow for an up or down vote on Caitlin Halligan's nomination. Let's debate Ms. Halligan on her merits. She deserves nothing less. Senator from Utah. Madam President, I rise to speak today in opposition to the nomination of Caitlin Halligan to be a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit is arguably the most important federal appellate court in our federal judicial system, with primary responsibility to review administrative decisions made by countless federal departments and agencies. It has also served in many instances as a stepping stone for judges who are later appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. As a result, the Senate has historically very closely scrutinized nominees to the D.C. Circuit. And when evaluating particular nominees, we've also carefully considered the need for additional judges on that court. In July 2006, President Bush nominated an eminently qualified lawyer, Peter Keisler, to fill a seat on the D.C. Circuit. Mr. Keisler is the, among the very finest attorneys in the country. Because of his non-ideological approach to the law, Mr. Keisler enjoys broad bipartisan support throughout the legal profession. Despite, despite these unassailable legal qualifications, Democratic senators blocked his nomination. He did not receive any floor consideration whatsoever, not even a cloture vote and his nomination languished in the Judiciary Committee. At the time, a number of Democratic senators sent a letter to the Judiciary Committee chairman arguing that a nominee to the D.C. Circuit, quote, should un under no circumstances be considered, much less confirmed, before we first address the very need for that judgeship, the judgeship that he would occupy. These senators specifically argued that the D.C. Circuit's comparatively modest caseload in 2006 simply did not justify the confirmation of an additional judge to that court. Five years have now passed, and Ms. Allican has been nominated to that very same seat on the D.C. Circuit. But the court's caseload remains just as minimal as it did then. According to the Administrative Office of U.S. Courts, the D.C. Circuit caseload per judge is approximately one-fourth that of most other federal courts of appeals. In each of the past two years, the D.C. Circuit has canceled regularly scheduled argument dates due to lack of pending cases. For several years, the court has experienced a decline in workload in terms of total filings, actions per active judge, and pending appeals. Almost every metric indicates the same direction. Indeed, since 2006, when Democrats blocked Mr. Keisler's nomination, the total number of appeals filed in the D.C. Circuit has decreased, decreased by 12 percent. According to the Democrats' own standards, and particularly when there are judicial emergencies in other courts across the country, now is not the time to confirm another judge to the D.C. Circuit. And it is most certainly not the time for us to consider confirming a controversial nominee with a record of extreme views of the law and the Constitution. Many of my colleagues have discussed these views, so I will limit myself this morning to just one example. In 2003, while serving as Solicitor General of New York, Ms. Halligan approved and signed a legal brief 
arguing that handgun manufacturers, wholesalers, and retail, retailers should be held liable for criminal actions that individuals commit with those guns. Three years later, in 2006, Ms. Halligan filed a brief alleging that handgun manufacturers were guilty of creating a public nuisance, that they themselves were guilty of creating a public nuisance. Such an activist approach is both bewildering and flatly inconsistent with the original understanding of the Second Amendment uh, and the, 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 the rights under the Second Amendment that American citizens enjoy. In conclusion, as measured by the Democrats' own standards and their prior actions, now is not the time to confirm another judge to the D.C. Circuit. And it is certainly not the time to consider such a controversial nominee for that important court. For these reasons, I cannot support Ms. Halligan's nomination and urge my colleagues to oppose her confirmation. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam Chair, I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. The Senator from Utah. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be divided equally. Without objection. I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Thank you. 
The Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, I ask uh, unanimous consent to speak. Is it mo in morning business? If that's we have it, we're in a quorum call. Oh, uh, I ask uh, unanimous consent to suspend the quorum call unless that objection. Unless Re my colleague reserving the right to object, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe we have a set number of minutes left to discuss uh, the nominee, Kate Halligan, which is a subject here. Uh, that is correct. How much time does the majority have left? Uh, Thirteen. Eight, I'm sorry, eight minutes. Okay, I would ask that the final eight minutes before we vote be reserved for that and the senator from Illinois be allowed to speak as if morning business uh, till we get to, uh, for five minutes. And then five minutes is good, good for me. Is, is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. The senator from Illinois. I yield the floor. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to speak as if in morning business to talk about the uh, big issue pending before the Senate, which is um, uh, the... Uh, potential legislation by Republicans or Democrats to cut contributions to Social Security. I'm very worried because in the legislation that we considered last week, uh, we had proposals to cut contributions to Social Security by $250 billion. And this was legislation proposed by Democratic leaders and then a separate piece of legislation by Republican leaders. And I think that legislation was a mistake on both sides. Now, we have precious few uh, bipartisan uh, institutions or contacts in this Senate. Senator Manchin and I, one Democrat, one Republican uh, uh, senator, both freshmen, we meet every Thursday uh, for lunch. And at our uh, Thursday lunch uh, last week, Senator Manchin initially said, well, I'm having difficulty. I don't think I'm going to be able to vote for the Democratic bill to cut Social Security contributions. And I said, well, I join you in that because I'm not going to be able to vote for the Republican bill uh, that cuts Social Security contributions. And so the two of us both voted pro-Social Security and against the legislation before us. I'm very worried uh, that we are forgetting the lessons that are currently playing out in Europe on this subject. The collapse of European socialism, as Margaret Thatcher says, eventually socialists run out of other people's money. The collapse of European socialism underscores a lesson that you cannot run a retirement security system without contributions. That we know already that the social security system is running slightly in the red. Contributions into the system are going to run $10 billion behind the cost of honoring uh, benefits to seniors. But under this legislation, we would underfund Social Security by $250 billion. We would increase the uh, tide of red ink to Social Security by 20 times. And I think that's a mistake. AARP tells us that Social Security is not a welfare program. It is a retirement security program paid by the contributions of workers. And we should run this program with the contribution of workers. And remember, if we make this decision to cut contributions to Social Security, we replace uh, those contributions with government bonds. But the government bonds that we would ask seniors to trust no longer have a AAA credit rating uh, from Standard & Poor's. It's basically asking seniors to trust us. Now, when you look at the details of the Democratic bill and the Republican bill, you see another disturbing trend. The Democratic and Republican bills both depend on revenue streams that take many years to repay what is lost to Social Security. Under the Republican bill, there are promised cuts which could be reversed by a future administration or Congress. And it takes until 2018 to repay the senior citizens uh, what has been lost in Social Security contributions under the trust fund. Under the Democratic bill, there was a political tax on millionaires, and it takes until 2021 uh, to repay seniors. And so the message that Senator Manchin and I had as uh, one Democrat and one Republican is, how about not charging seniors? How about not causing a tide of red ink to Social Security? How about making sure that we maintain contributions to that program? Seniors have enough to worry about right now. They should not worry about the future solvency of Social Security. One analyst described how under the legislation it requires temporary borrowing additional of $240 billion uh, for the federal budget. And I'm worried 
that that kind of borrowing could trigger an earlier loss of the debt limit of the United States. So we could trigger the battle that we all expect for next January to actually happen ominously for the president prior to the election if this legislation would pass. Common sense should prevail here. We should run a retirement security system uh, with adequate uh, contributions to maintain benefits. Uh, that we should uh, agree on a bipartisan basis that Social Security is one of the most successful federal programs uh, ever designed. Uh, that we should say to seniors, among all the other worries you have, you should not worry about Congress underfunding the trust fund of Social Security. That we should say to seniors, we are not replacing solid contributions coming in from workers with bonds that no longer have a AAA credit rating uh, from Standard & Poor's. I would urge members of AARP to reach out to your leaders and say, we want to urge you to forcefully advocate for maintaining adequate contributions to Social Security. That we don't think promises of a millionaire's tax that uh, repays the debts until 2021 or spending cuts that repay uh, the debts until 2018 are something that we can fully trust. And so I would urge members of this body to maintain adequate contributions to Social Security, to defeat both the Republican and Democratic bills here, to learn the lessons of Europe that we need to maintain a retirement security system with adequate contributions, and that we should not sink the Social Security Trust Fund in a wave of red ink on gimmick legislation uh, which already would uh, impinge the credit of the United States to a degree that uh, should not be impinged uh, any further. And with that, Mr. President, I yield back and uh, thank my uh, senior colleague from uh, New York. Mr. President. The Senator from New York. And I'd ask unanimous consent that I be given the remainder of the time if no one is here from the minority to speak uh, against this nomination. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, Mr. President, I rise this morning in support of the President's first and only nominee to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Caitlin J. Halligan is a nominee whom any President of any party would be proud of. I know from speaking to her and getting to know her over the last year, and it has been over a year since she, has, since she was nominated, that she has earned this honor. She has earned it through dint of hard work and native intelligence. And importantly, Halligan has dedicated most of her professional life to government service. I challenge, I challenge anyone in this chamber to think hard about what we are looking for in a judge to the second most important court in the land. If you do, you must conclude that Kate Halligan deserves an up or down vote. Does the president have to nominate a political conservative to clear the hurdle? Halligan is clearly a moderate, far more moderate than many on my side would choose if they were nominating on their own without an advise and consent process. Does the president have to nominate a lawyer who has practiced law in the shadows, never addressing a major legal issue of importance to the nation in her entire career? Because the only arguments against Caitlin Halligan are gotcha arguments that, don't, that simply take little snippets of what she did in past law practice, representing clients, not her own views, and say, gotcha. Mr. President, in 2000, in 2005, 14 of my colleagues formed what was called the Gang of 14 in order to reduce filibusters and overcome the push to change Senate rules to get rid of the filibuster, this bipartisan group agreed not to filibuster any nominees who did not present extraordinary circumstances. Now, extraordinary circumstances were not defined, but my colleague Senator Graham, a leader in that Gang of 14 effort, to his credit, Senator Graham said on the floor at the time completely reasonably that it meant no ideological attacks. Senator Graham said, and I quote Mr. President, Senator Graham said, ideological attacks are not an extraordinary circumstance.
To me, it would have to be a character problem, an ethics problem. So allegations about the qualifications of a person, not an ideological bent. Caitlin Callaghan does not have a character problem or an ethics problem. No one has alleged she does. It's that simple. So, Mr. President, if this body cannot invoke cloture on her nomination today, the Gang of 14 agreement, it would seem to me, would be violated. The approach taken by Senate con Republicans will have lasting consequences beyond this one nomination. It seems to me that a vote against this nominee is a vote that declares the Gang of 14 agreement null and void. Now, I was not a party to that agreement, but it would be impossible to deny that it has guided this body's consideration of judges since 2005 under both Democratic and Republican presidents. If Republicans are going to suddenly junk that six-year armistice, it could risk throwing the Senate into chaos on judicial nominees. Senate Republicans seem to want to declare open season for filibusters of judges again, at least at the Court of Appeals level. Admittedly and gladly, things as of late have gotten much better at the district court level. But the defeat of Caitlin Halligan would throw into chaos nominations at the, court, at the circuit court for a long, long time to come. Any attempt to paint her as so far out of the mainstream that she presents an extraordinary circumstance is twisting the, her record far beyond recognition. Any attempt to do so would make any nominee by a Democratic or a Republican president susceptible to that unfair charge. Now, I have always said that ideology matters, but I've also said that candidates need only to be mainstream, not too far right, not too far left. I don't like nominees who are at the extremes, left or right, because they tend to be ideologues who want to make law, not interpret and follow law. Well, Halligan fits the bill of a moderate mainstream nominee precisely to a T. Halligan has spent her career in government in both political and plenty of non-political positions. She has worked as a lawyer's lawyer and has expressed few views on public issues. She has written virtually nothing, but at her hearing she did answer questions. She acknowledged that executive power extends to indefinite detention of enemy combatants during time of war, something that might be disputed among mainstream members of this body, particularly if they were citizens picked up on American soil. We just had that debate. That she would act with fealty to text and original intent interpreting laws in the Constitution. That she believes the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to bear arms, therefore thereby vindicating the Heller case. That the Eighth Amendment protects the constitutionality of the death penalty. Now, some of my colleagues have tried to, tried to paint Halligan because she has filed briefs on behalf of clients, and they say that that somehow indicates she'd be an activist judge. First, I'd like to point out, she's not the first nominee to come before the Senate and state that the views in the briefs that she writes of her clients are not of her own. Guess who did it regularly and repeatedly? Now Chief Justice Roberts. Did Democrats filibuster Justice Roberts because he did that? Did we say that the views he wrote on behalf of clients had to be attributed to his own views? Of course not. Second, I'd like to rebut some of the things I've heard on, this floor, on the floor this morning about particular cases. First, while she did represent the state of New York against gun manufacturers, those cases were made moot by congressional law. In her hearing, Halligan recognized this and said unequivocally, that she supports the individual right to bear arms. Second, it is simply wrong to suggest that Caitlin Halligan is somehow outside the mainstream on immigration because she filed a brief advocating that businesses should not be rewarded for hiring illegal immigrants by getting out of the requirement that back pay should be awarded when the workers are exploited. Again, this was a brief filed on behalf of a client, not representing her own view. Third, in the case of Almari, there is no argument that Halligan did anything other than make arguments on behalf of a client that were well within the mainstream.
President Bush, the last President Bush, and his administration abandoned the case and then charged Al Mari in civilian court. No different than the argument Halligan was making. Mr. President, why are we arguing about whether she deserves an up or down vote? Because frankly, as with the Supreme Court, this is part of the far right's attempt to pull the D.C. Circuit further and further away from the mainstream. Many conservatives tend to decry, quote, liberal judicial activism. But what they really want is judicial activism of the right. They don't want lawyers to be down the middle and interpret law. They want to change the way the whole government has operated for decades through the one unelected body, the Article III body, the judiciary. A truly moderate judicial philosophy shows respect for Congress, for executive agencies that interpret the law, and for well-settled understandings that the American people commonly hold about democracy. And there's not a single question that Halligan adheres to these principles. She has extensive government experience. She understands the demands and roles of the other branches. She has been a responsible and rigorous advocate for all of her clients, including the people of New York. I have no doubt that as a judge she will be responsible and rigorous advocate for the rule of law. Anyone who has listened to her answer an hour of questions in the committee and read her responses to the 150 questions that were submitted for the record cannot doubt but that she is an even and modest in her, in her approach to judicial, an even and modest temperament and philosophy in her approach to legal questions. Let me just cite one example. When she was asked by Senator Grassley her view of deference to the legislative branch here, so she responded, quote, I think that the job of a judge is to examine the constitutionality of a statute when a constitutional challenge is presented. But I think that authority has to be exercised very sparingly and very carefully. Time and time again, she answered similarly with clear and unambiguous answers. Some of my colleagues have accused Halligan of lacking candor in her answers. Well, Mr. President, I have sat through a lot of hearings for nominees to federal courts of appeals. I know evasion when I see it. Halligan was not evasive. Some of the same people who say that she did lack candor still defend Miguel Estrada, who didn't answer a single question because it might come before him as a judge. She answered questions thoughtfully, forthrightly, explained the context of any past statements that might seem to have contradicted her current views. Now this morning, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle pointed to two things that she did not write to try and indicate she has activist views. First, she gave a speech in 2003 on behalf of her boss, Elliot Spitzer, that she did not write herself. In fact, she stepped in at the last minute to give the speech when he could not make it. She did not write it and she clarified at the time that it did not reflect her personal views. Second, she was a member of a committee that issued a report on executive power and enemy combatants. She explained in the committee she hadn't seen the report, and did not agree with either its content or its tone. In her hearing, she clearly stated her views on executive power. This should have cleared up any doubt about her ability to recognize and respect the current state of law. Mr. Finally, I want to say a word about the red herring argument that has been raised today that the workload of the D.C. Circuit is too low to confirm Halligan. I've expressed this concern too and in fact in 2008 we voted to take away one of the seats of the D.C. Circuit. It now has 11 judges rather than 12. But I as well as many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle have in, past, have in the past reserved our concern for nominees of the 11th seat and what was then the 12th seat. Halligan has been nominated for the 9th seat. There are only eight members on that court which now has a roster of 11. The 10th and 11th seats remain vacant. No one ever until now on either side of the aisle has ever argued that the D.C. Circuit should have only eight judges. I wonder if control of the body change which
which I don't think it will, or we get a Republican president, which I don't think we will, how quickly our colleagues on the other side of the aisle will abandon that foolish and specious argument. I'm concerned that we're hearing it now for the first time because the current makeup of the court happens to have five Republican appointees and three Democratic nominees. Time has expired. Mr. President, I would ask unanimous consent that I be given one and a half more minutes to just finish this point. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. When we confirmed President Bush's nominee to the 11th seat in 2005, Thomas Griffith, his confirmation resulted in there being 121 pending cases per judge. We did not hear a peep out of the other side that that was too low. And yet today there are 161 cases per judge. Halligan's nomination would go down to 143, far more than the 121 when all my colleagues on the other side of the aisle voted for Mr. Griffith, the Republican nominee of President Bush. So there's no reason to argue about caseload. The fact is, if we can't confirm Halligan, this won't go down as a vote about caseload. This will be recorded as a new bar for nominees. In conclusion, Mr. President, when Caitlin Halligan drove with her father from her home in Kansas City to Harvard, or when she was a standout student at Georgetown Law, or when she started her work for the New York Attorney General's office, I'm sure that she could not have imagined that someday she would be the, the topic of a debate in the United States about whether she was too radical or lacked the candor to be a judge. I hope that when we vote and the debate is over, my colleagues recognize the truth here. Halligan is a sterling example of a public servant who has worked hard, earned every honor she has received, and fits squarely within the mainstream of judicial thought. She deserves an up or down vote today, and I will be proud to cast my vote for cloture on Caitlin Halligan's nomination. Under the previous order, the clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the nomination of Caitlin Joan Halligan of New York to be United States Circuit Judge for the District of Columbia Circuit. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the nomination of Caitlin Joan Halligan of New York to be United States Circuit Judge for the District of Columbia Circuit shall be brought to a close. The A's and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayat, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bacchus, Mr. Begich, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagan. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heller. Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Inoue, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, 
Mr. Kyle. Ms. Landrieu. Mr. Lautenberg. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Mr. Lee. Mr. Levin. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Luger. Mr. Manchin. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCasco. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Risch. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Sessions. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Snow. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Mr. Webb. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative, Brown of Ohio, Franken, Gillibrand, Leahy, Schumer, Tester, and Udall of New Mexico. Senators voting in the negative, Barrasso, Brown of Massachusetts, Cornyn, Grassley, Hutchison, Inhofe, Johans, Kirk, and Toomey. Mr. Levin, aye. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, aye. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Kyle, Mr. Kyle, no. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye.
Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Isaacson, no. Conrad. Mr. Conrad, aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, no. Mr. Luger. Mr. Luger. No. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Lee, no. Ms. Ayotte. No. Ms. Ayotte, no. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, no. Mr. Blumenthal, aye. No. Mr. Dement, no. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Vitter, no. Mr. Akaka, aye. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, aye. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coates, no. Mr. Risch, Mr. Risch, no. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden, aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar, aye.
Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson of Florida, aye. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Baucus. 